So it's a great time to start something new with the new school year. And we are starting this new series on the family. And for the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at some of the corrosive elements that can do a lot of harm in our families. And, uh, and so we're starting here, you can tell from the, the reading Drew did, that we're starting with the very first family having the very first set of dysfunctions. It didn't last long before all got kind of out of whack. But as we move through this, I hope that you'll take this home. God gives us the people in our immediate families as our learning ground, as like our place where we can be in school to learn the lessons about how to be the most wholehearted, loving people that we can be. Family really does matter. So will you pray with me? Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, so as we start into this, I know that time is an issue, so I'm going to try and move quickly. If I get to where I'm talking too fast, somebody just stand up and tell me, slow down, okay? Because I'm feeling, I know that there's a lot going on today for people with school and everything. But let's jump right in. We're going back, way back, 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 back to that first family, Adam and Eve. And all summer long, we've been talking about enough, having enough, being satisfied with enough. And the first thing that we see that goes wrong, they're in paradise. But there's the one tree, and so they feel dissatisfied. And there's others, there's a whole other sermon to, to preach about that. But that's where we've been all summer. How can we be happy with the paradise that we're in and not be overwhelmed by dissatisfaction and go heading towards that tree? So moving from that now into families, they eat from the tree, as you know, and uh, God catches them. They realize they're in trouble. They're afraid of being in trouble, so they're hiding. And the very first thing is that when God says, what have you done to Adam? He does a double whammy. I don't know if you have noticed that, but blame going out, because it's not only she did it, she made me eat, it's the one you gave me. Like, there should have been a better one. There was a better one for him. God. And, uh, and so, then Eve is standing there, so God goes, well, if I had been Eve, I would have been a little mad at being thrown under the bus. Well, there weren't buses. Thrown under something in Eden. But, uh, and I would have been like, but none of that. The first thing that she does, snake. The snake did it. Blame snake. And everybody gets in trouble by God. But blame it's the first thing, because as human beings, when we feel any kind of discomfort, when we feel any kind of frustration, we are hardwired to go straight to blame. It's just the part of our nature. You can see Adam and Eve, first thing, blame. So we have to be on the lookout for it. I deal with this all the time in my life. We have... Um, I'm a short person. I know y'all are like, what? I, I know. But um, we have these cabinets, and they are too high for me. And so I open them, and I'm like tossing water bottles and, and stuff in there. It's our measuring cups. And it all kind of just goes in there, because I'm trying to unload the dishwasher, right? And so I'm just like tossing the stuff in. And then when I open the cabinet, it all falls on my head in a giant cascade of stuff. Boom, 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 water bottles, ah, thermos, ah. Thermos is hurt when they, when they go. But it's all like, ah, and it's all over the floor. And Lola and Ruby, sorry about this, but my first, there is not a nanosecond, but I'm thinking, girls! Now, now just to be clear, I know that I put the stuff in the cabinet. It was me. I set a trap for my own self. I know that, but the way it works is I'm thinking, I think, because again, it's not rational thought, it just happens quick. I'm thinking, they do not need all these water bottles. Why do we have all these water bottles? If we didn't have them, they would not cascade onto my head. And see, that doesn't even make any sense, but that's where I go, girls. And then, but then I get a handle on myself and I realize, I have no one to blame but myself, which is not a good feeling. But that happens a lot where, like that, Blame, because when we are uncomfortable, that's where we go as humans. Whose 
fault is it? Who can I blame? Because it discharges the discomfort, gives us a little sense of control. It has a purpose, but I will tell you that it is absolutely corrosive in your families, in my family, with human relationships. Because blame is the opposite of accountability. And accountability is what fosters good, solid relationships. Adam and Eve should have said, when God said, what have you done? They should have said, we ate the fruit. We are so sorry. You clearly said not to. Something like that, but no. That's accountability. It's accountability when I say, you know, if I would put those things in the cabinet instead of just shoving them in there, they wouldn't fall on my head. And I get to it. It just takes me a little bit of a roundabout to finally get there. But accountability is where a lot of the positive growth in our relationships can be, but it is hard because it's vulnerable to be accountable because people could be mad at you. And in our culture, this is a really important thing for us to be talking about because it's getting worse and worse. In our culture, some of it we understand why they do it, and I'm not hating on this, but if you have robbed a bank, you are instructed to tell the judge and everyone else, I'm not guilty, not guilty, and then maybe start thinking about who to blame if you do get caught. But we, we don't, that accountability piece is not hardwired in, and people don't want to be in trouble, and you guys, all of these things are, are, are different things to talk about in depth, but when we are raised on punishment as a model, when your parents punish you for things, what you learn is how to avoid the punishment. What you learn is how to not get caught, but you don't actually change from the inside out. Punishment as a model doesn't grow us into humane people of character. It teaches us to go around and make sure nobody finds out what you did, right? So again, it's about no accountability. If you're afraid of punishment, you're going to try to avoid getting found out. So all of these things all conspire to keep us from just being accountable and admitting what we've done. It's a huge problem. But again, as I said, it's corrosive to relationships. And if we are going to try to grow ourselves into more and more of the image of Jesus Christ, we have to look at him and say, you know what? There was never any blame. When he was on the cross, he had people to blame. He could have blamed the Jewish leadership. He could have blamed Rome. He could have blamed his disciples who weren't there. He surely could have blamed Judas. All of those had a role in him being unfairly on that cross. But he didn't. Instead, on the cross, he prayed to God and said, God, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. So no blame, just forgiveness. That's the model that we're trying to grow into. So we have to figure out how do we get past this completely hardwired human tendency to go straight to blame. The first thing is to notice you're doing it. And again, it's so sneaky. It happens so lightning fast. I was taking the girls to a camp the other week and I had my coffee. It was morning. We were going to this camp and the one entrance into their parking lot came up sooner than I expected it to and so I had to put on my brakes and the coffee went leaping in this beautiful arc out of the thermos and onto my lap and my dress and then then all and um many, many things going on there. First of all, I didn't have the lid down on the coffee, and I'm the one who was going too fast to stop slowly for the entrance, right? It was me, and I could have been using my eyes better. All of this is all on me, every bit of it, and the first thing I'm thinking, again like that, wasn't girls this time. I'll let y'all off the hook. It wasn't y'all. It was the camp, because somehow like they should have had their entrance better marked, if it was better marked, I could have seen it and, and gone in. God, this camp, ah. And uh, that, y'all, that didn't even make any sense. But that's where I was, camp. And, and it happens, with, you know, you're driving. I saw a statistic that 80% of drivers engage in road rage. I, I thought, 
no, that's not true. And then I thought about what well, depends on how you define it, right? If you speed up so that that person that wants around you so bad can't get around you, but you're like, ah, I'm speeding up, you can't get over, that counts. That's road rage too. All of this stuff. And then you can blame that person for why you're in a bad mood. As Christians, we have to just notice that we're doing it. And then you ask yourself, here's where it starts getting hard. What's my part in this? What's my part in this? Even if somebody else did do something that's got you frustrated, what's my part in this? Because that's where you get control, and that's where you can be accountable. What's my part in this? I didn't have my coffee shut the right way. I, didn't, I was going too fast to make the turn. There's plenty of part for me in that. And in the small things and the big things, notice that you're doing it, and then what's my part in this? Bringing it back to yourself. And then once you have figured it out, then you're going to have to think, what do I need to do to clean up this mess? And I don't mean the coffee mess. I mean the relationship messes when you blow up at somebody. Like let's say you're angry, you blow up at them. What I notice is that a lot of folks don't want to take accountability to that next step. They're not going to apologize takes vulnerability to apologize and we're not good at that as a culture but to notice I, I blew up first thing will be well but if she hadn't done that or if they hadn't done that if the girls lung, 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 whatever it is all the reasons you bring it back what's my part in this and then you clean it up by apologizing and, and doing a real apology and I think that is one of the rarest things in all of our culture is a true apology. So I'm gonna give you some examples of apologies. These are all things that I have heard. And if it is a real apology, in your opinion, the kind that supports healthy relationships, I want you to clap, okay? If it's not, if it's not the kind of apology that actually feels like an apology when you're on the receiving end, I want you to boo, okay? Got it? Clap or boo. So the terrible thing happened, whatever it was, and the person's apology is, hey, I'm sorry you took it that way. I can't tell y'all how many times I've heard that, though. So sorry that you took it that way. That does not count. So good, y'all are, are one for one. I wouldn't yell if you do what I say when I say do it. Yeah, there's no apology in that. Or how about this one? Looking away through gritted teeth. Sorry. That. <laughs> well, you know what? Y'all have all been trained by your parents to say, you tell him you're sorry. You tell him, sorry. Now hug him and make, make up. And you're like, ugh, hug, ugh. And, and yeah, that, yeah. We still do that as adults. I'm sorry, ugh. And uh, yeah, no, but, but seriously, y'all, there is a step better. Y'all can do even better than that. Um, okay, how about this one? I said I was sorry. Can't you get over it? Yeah, I hear that one too. Or how about this one? Wow, a little bit ago I yelled at you, and that is not how I want to act. You did not deserve that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's harder than you'd think because it is vulnerable as can be. But it's not putting any blame on them. It's just saying, I did this. I, I don't want to be that way. You didn't deserve that. And sometimes you can even say, will you accept my apology? But sometimes people don't want to hear the other person respond. Notice this in yourself. It is really, really hard to hear the pain you've caused somebody else. I used to do mediation work in prisons, and one of the things that would sometimes happen is I would be working with, in, in several cases, a father who had not been loving in the ways a father should be to a daughter, and he was now in prison. And they would come together, and this was sort of a reconciliation process, and the first step was for him to acknowledge. Sometimes people won't even acknowledge, you know, what they've done, but acknowledge what he'd done, and maybe tell a bit about some of the things going on with him, no excuses, but acknowledgement. Then it was time for him to be quiet and listen. Listen to her tell him 
how what he had done had affected her life, the pain it had caused her, what it had meant in her life. And almost every time, that part was so horrible for the father. They couldn't, bear, they could get through, they could get through the accountability piece of I did this, and, but the, the next piece, just listening, they couldn't. So I would typically have these men say, like we talked about before, I said I'm sorry. Can't you take my sorry? Do I have to open a vein? Or I know what you're thinking. I'm a horrible person. I'm terrible. She hadn't said any of that. But it's easier for them to keep control over it than to hear the pain that they've caused. Sometimes you have to be willing to listen. And, ooh, it's not always easy. But if you want to build the relationships in your life, that's part of accountability, is being able to hear it. Now, here's, this brings us to something really important. In communication, you think of it like a tennis court. Can you picture like a tennis court? And I'm over here, and I'm going to serve the ball. I'm, this is my something I'm saying in communication. I have intent, what I intend when I say what I say. But when that ball goes over the net, and the other person, it bounces, and then they're going to receive it, there is impact of what I've said on them. And these do not always line up. My intent may have nothing to do with the impact. Some of you have probably been in these situations. But if somebody said to me, gosh, in fact, I've had this happen. <laughs> How come your backside's so big? <laughs> you know what? They may intend that as the funniest thing. But that hurts me. I'm sensitive about that stuff. Right, you with me? They intend it to be funny, but it hurt my feelings because I am an oversensitive mess, maybe a little bit. But no, it doesn't matter. It's not because I'm wrong. It's just the impact is not the same as intent. You, this is really huge. You guys with me on this? People intend things, and the impact could be something different. Well, what we're seeing in our culture right now is an interesting phenomena where People are not wanting to be responsible for the impact of their words. Now, we're hearing this politically a lot this season. What they're saying out there, now I'm not getting into politics, but I am talking about this one thing because as Christians, we need to look at this. What I'm hearing a lot is, I'm tired of all that political correctness. Well, political correctness is code, I think, for I should be able to say whatever I intend without worrying about the impact on you. I don't want to be politically correct. I want to say that she is a fat and loud pig. So why shouldn't I be able to? Political correctness starts seeming like a cover for, it's just rudeness. As Christians, maybe more than any other people, we are responsible for the impact of our words. So we can't just say, well, I don't want to be politically correct. Politically correct, there could be all kinds of things about that, but what we're hearing a lot is people saying that because they don't want to have to have any filter. They want to be able to say whatever they want about, I have heard, Muslims are ruining this country and they need to be sent back or kept out. I have heard she is fat and ugly and terrible. People are losers, on and on and on. And it's said with impunity because I don't, I'm not politically correct, which I think means I'm just going to be rude and not be responsible for my impact. We are, because we are not going to cause harm to other people in this world. And I know it feels like it gets out of control. Lately, I'm hearing a lot of people frustrated that at colleges, folks have to say, trigger warning. Y'all have all said, and, and, and I know, it can seem like, golly, Aren't people getting too sensitive? Well, you know what? If the impact of my words causes harm to somebody else because there's a trigger for them that causes pain, it's really not my business if they're too sensitive. What do, harm does it do me to say, you know, before we talk about this situation, a trigger warning, we're going to talk about sexual assault, or trigger warning, we're going to talk about hate crimes. But everybody's worrying that other people are too sensitive. And as Christians, just, just so that you know, 
It is our job to be aware of the impact of our words and our actions and to not cause harm. So yeah, we're not going to say the rude thing. We're not going to say the hateful thing if we can help it. It's just like if I'm going through a door, da da da, into a store, I'm going to check behind me that I'm not about to let that door slam into somebody's face, right? I've had that door. I was holding lemonades this time, and so right, my lemonade fell. Here's the thing about that. We, we aren't alone in this world. It's not all about us. As Christians, we're to love our neighbor as ourselves and love our enemies. So we do need to think about the impact of our words. So sometimes if I say, I'm sorry I said that, I can see that it hurt your feelings, you can say, I didn't intend that. But you let that person say, here's why that hurt. And then they tell you, we're responsible for the impact as well as our intent. So we have a higher obligation. We were in Arkansas this past week, and I saw more overt racism than I have ever seen in my life. I'm at an age where I missed the colored fountains and all of that stuff. There was, I'm not saying there wasn't racism, there was, but we saw these billboards. One billboard, big old billboard said, diversity is code for white genocide. Another billboard showed this little precious girl holding a puppy, I kid you not, holding this puppy, sad, both of them sad, side eyes, and it said, it is not hateful to love your people, hashtag white power radio. And I thought, wow, really? This is, these things have an impact on people. But where we are is that everybody's going, but I should be able to say what I need to say. I should be able to speak my piece. There's a free country and First Amendment and all of those things. Okay, but I'm telling you that as Christians, the impact matters. And we have to realize we're not alone in this world and we're to love people. Even if maybe in the secrecy of our own heads we think, you're being kind of sensitive. That doesn't matter. We don't know their history. We don't know what they've been through. And so if, you, if somebody gives you the gift of saying, that hurt my feelings, it doesn't feel like a gift when they say that. I, I'm not kidding. It, oh, it's like, oh, you get defensive. And you'll want to blame. Well, if you hadn't, blah, blah, blah. To just listen and receive it and be accountable for what you said that's what Jesus is wanting to grow us into. That's where we're headed. And that is where our wholehearted, beautiful family relationships can happen. But it starts with accountability, recognizing our part, and then recognizing that sometimes the impact is not at all what we intended. And then clean up our mess. Maybe that could be our motto as Christians. We're not the only people here. It's not all about us, and we clean up our mess. Because we're all making mistakes all the time. And if we're not accountable, how are we going to grow? How are we going to become people who care for the earth or who in private do the thing of higher character? It all starts with recognizing our own stuff. Now, the other side of this coin that we're going to get to is when you are the one who's been hurt, how on earth do we forgive? So that'll be what we're going to come into next time. But first, notice your own stuff and know that Jesus is with you. He who refused to blame when he had every justification, but instead it was only love. Will you pray with me? Loving God, our family relationships are so important. Help us to treasure them. Help us to be the people you would have us be. Help us to be love for our families. Help us move past blame and into a deeper sense of accountability. Make us more and more in your image every day. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.